Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started here. So welcome again to the Recruiting and Supporting Caregivers, What We Know and What We Don't webinar. We really appreciate how, how this was great turnout for this. We really appreciate everybody registering and also hanging in there with us. We had to uh, postpone this once for in mid-March for obvious reasons, and we're, we're so glad that so many people could join us for this great conversation today. Uh, the webinar is sponsored by Binti, one of the leaders in bringing technological solutions to bear and helping to recruit and retain foster parents. Uh, it's also brought to you by the Chronicle Social Change, daily national news source for child welfare and juvenile justice, and Fostering Families Today, which is a bi-monthly print magazine that's mailed directly into the homes of resource parents and adoptive parents. Those two publications are uh, produced by the same nonprofit, which is Fostering Media Connections. So my name is John Kelly. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Chronicle of Social Change, and I'm going to uh, play host and moderator today. I'm joined by an excellent panel to discuss this critical part of the child welfare system. I'm going to run through them real quick here, and you'll have a chance to hear much more from them as we go. Uh, Jill dewar is a Zellerbach Family Foundation professor at the University of California, Berkeley. Hi, Jill. Um, Barrett Johnson, Director of Business Development for Binti. Hey, Barrett. Um, we've got Jennifer Rodriguez is the executive director of the Youth Law Center and a, uh, which is in California, but is a really a key organization in the National Quality Parenting Initiative and the Children Need Amazing Parents campaign, CHAMPS campaign is what you'll mostly hear that as and you're going to hear a little bit about both of those um, as we go. And then last but certainly not least is Marissa Sanders, who is the director of the West Virginia Foster Adoptive and Kinship Network, which is also involved in CHAMPS. Uh, so we know quite a bit about the uh, children who come into foster care as a result of child protection investigations, how many children there are, why they are there, how long they stay, all kinds of demographic information. We know far less about the people who care for these children when they are removed from their homes due to safety concerns. But the knowledge base about who cares for youth who can't stay at home, how best to recruit, train, and support them is starting to build. So we're gonna to start today with a really quick overview of some of the evolving data we're trying to collect the Chronicle of Social Change. And then I'm gonna move really quickly to the experts here for discussions about recruitment, technology's important role in this work, training quality uh, for foster parents, and advocating at the local level for caregivers. Uh, we're then going to devote a little time to the elephant in the room, which of course is coronavirus and how it and the, social, the ensuing social changes have impacted foster care and foster parenting. And after that, we will move to taking as many questions as we possibly can. Um, if you'd like to uh, ask us a question offline, all of our contact email is gonna be available on one of the last slides in this, uh, in this webinar. But if you'd like to ask a question during the webinar, please type that question into the chat function. That's the easiest way for us to kind of aggregate them and me to get those questions out to the panel. And I will answer one question we get quite a bit when we do these right off the top. We will be sending a copy of the webinar out to everybody who has registered. So whether you attended the entire thing or part of it um, or didn't attend at all, you will be getting a recording of this. Uh, so without further ado, let me go into a little bit of what we've been doing at uh, the Chronicle of Social Change in terms of collecting data in this space. Um, since 2017, the Chronicle of Social Change has been working on something called the Who Cares Project. Um, at its core, what we're trying to get to are putting numbers um, first on how many children and youth are in foster care today. Like I said, there are federal uh, data collection on that that, are, uh, that track a, a few years behind, frankly, and we try to get a, a kind of more updated um, number to put on that. But more importantly, we're looking at where and with whom they're living. So we, we do two things. We put a request out to each state to ask them things like how many non-relative foster homes they have, how many licensed foster homes they have, how many relatives with active placements into foster care uh, are currently in their in the works in, in their state. Um, and then we pair that with some uh, specialty federal data that we uh, collect with the help of uh, research experts who are much better at us um, at putting the, the data together. Uh, I just, you can, you can look at, you can, you can visit um, our Who Cares Project at fostercarecapacity.org, fostercarecapacity.org. We have each state-by-state -state profile, some national stuff, and, and some of the uh, journalism that we've done around that project there. I just wanted to go over a few 
kind of top line things before we get to the experts here and what we've been able to find in the first, kind of early years of this project. Um, so really on that top line of like licensed foster homes, um, Natalia, uh, if you want to move to the next slide here. Um, you know, I think this may, may surprise some people and certainly this is something that we're going to want to track over a much longer period of time. But, you know, in, in 2018, um, what we found nationally was that the, uh, from 2018 to 2019, the number actually of, of licensed foster homes went up. Um, using uh, state responses on this with a little bit of extrapolation for some states that didn't respond fully, uh, we gauged the total in 2018 at 210 to 250,000, 15,000 licensed homes. In 2019, that had ticked up to 220,000 to 225,000. But what we also know from, from collecting this is that um, it's not a neat, tight narrative around the country. Um, if you look at the next slide here that's coming, um, what we found is that we were able to make comparisons uh, from state to state in 45 different states. And in uh, 20 of those states, uh, there was actually a decrease in the number of licensed homes. Um, and in 10 of those states, it was actually quite a large increase. So I'm going to go through uh, our slides, honestly, a little bit quickly so we can get to the experts here. Uh, but here's just a, a quick map that we put together of the, the states that saw the, uh, the largest increases and decreases in, uh, in the last two years. Uh, tell you if you want to go to the next slide here. Another thing that we found um, largely through the uh, federal data that we've been able to, to put into this project is that there is a, I think, unsurprising to many people in child welfare, dramatic increase in the use of uh, kinship caregivers. Um, we found 44 states using the federal data that have increased their reliance on kin from the period between 2012 and 2016. Um, something that we're very much trying to learn more about <laughs> that we found is that there are 23 states uh, that at least on paper provided no payments uh, to more than half of their relative caregivers. Um, and that, that federal data really should be, is supposed to be focused on, on foster care. So it's, it's something that we're very interested in. Um, the Family First Prevention Services Act, uh, which took effect in uh, 2019 and was passed in 2018, uh, something I just wanted to flag here quickly uh, because that could lead to even more reliance on kin to, uh, to take care of children outside of the home. Uh, and then this is actually not part of our uh, data collection, but I really, I really think this is probably one of the most important pieces of research that we've had in child welfare in the last couple of years. This was done by the Center for State Child Welfare Data, Fred Wilchin and company over there. Uh, what they did was they looked, they followed basically the life of 15,000 homes that became licensed as foster parents starting in 2011. Um, and these numbers, I don't think there's any way to look at these other than to say that we've got work to do. <laughs> um, the, by 2016, of the homes that had been licensed in 2011, only 5% remained. And in, as of 2016, the, the number of homes who have been licensed just the year before, only about a quarter, 27%, remained uh, active licensed foster, foster homes. So I think that, that, was, that was really something I wanted to, uh, to flag as we were talking a little bit about data at the top here. Um, but enough of this, I wanna move to our expert panel to uh, to go through the issues, and we're going to start with Jill Dewar-Barrick out of uh, UC Berkeley, who is uh, who is going to lead us off here. So thanks, Jill. Take it away. You bet, John. Can you hear me? I can hear you great. Yep. Oh yay! Okay, great. Hi everybody. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to participate today. I'm extri I'm super happy to be here. I'm going to talk very briefly about some research uh, relating to recruitment, retention, and support. Um, can you move on to the next slide? Thank you. So just to put it in context, John just said that there are at least 20 states that have shortages for foster parents, but we're not alone if that helps to, to make it feel any better. It's really an international problem and every country in Europe struggles with trying to recruit sufficient number of foster parents to care for all the kids who need care. Um, but nevertheless, it's a serious problem and one that, we've, that I think we can figure out. Um, because there's some data to suggest that one quarter of American adults have considered fostering at some point in their lives. 
So we just have to figure out a way to turn that contemplation into action. Because as all of you know, there's a dramatic drop off from contemplation to action. And very few people actually pick up the phone and consider calling you to say, hey, I want to be a foster parent. So we just have to figure out what to do in that interim period between contemplation and action, and we will have solved the problem. The other piece of the problem to bear in mind is if any of you look at your current foster parents uh, census, you'll find that about 20% are called the vital few. Those 20% of caregivers care for about 80% of all the kids in care. And so part of the challenge is looking at the other 80% uh, of foster parents who only come in and care for that one or two children, as John was alluding to in that previous slide, how to keep them in our system to continue to care for kids. Some of the 80% who leave, they leave for great reasons because they attain permanency and they go to guardianship or adoption, but the majority of them don't stay because of permanency. The majority of them leave and the reason they leave is, uh, I'll go in, into some detail about why they leave, why we, why we can't retain them. So Talia, you wanna move forward? Thank you. So what do we know about um, who we're trying to recruit and how do we recruit? We, the way we recruit is a million different ways. We put billboards up, we send out flyers in, in, in our election. Um, we have go to fairs, state fairs, and we try to recruit folks. We actually don't have any evidence to suggest that any of the ways that we recruit are any better than other ways to recruit. We think the word of mouth is fairly effective, but if we're trying to really turn the needle on increasing the number of caregivers in the United States who will become our foster parents, we really don't know how to do it. So figuring out the what we do and how we do it is an important critical piece of information we need. But we do know something about who we're trying to recruit. So if you look at the research evidence on effective caregivers, folks who stick with kids, who go towards permanency, who provide stability of care, who provide loving, effective homes, you do see that where there's some qualities that they have in common. These are caregivers who have a sense of humor, they're flexible, they have a lot of tolerance for rejection, many believe in a higher power, they're teachable and they like to learn, they're up for a challenge, they're family focused and child centered, and they're very loving individuals. Now the challenge is, I didn't mention any demographic characteristics. So when we recruit, we re typically recruit for people with characteristics uh, that are demographic, maybe age or gender or race or geography. But actually what we need to be recruiting for are personality characteristics. And that's part of the challenge is how do you do recruitment when you're looking for a personality instead of something that is observable perhaps in a census tract. Next slide, please. So what we also know is that caregivers will tell us in the research that they are very isolated and they need a lot of support. And this is incredibly important, particularly in the first months or the first year of care. So we finally bring them in, we move them to contemplation, we move them to action, we bring them into our foster parent pool, and then we don't support them in ways that they need. So they tell us it's isolated, they tell us it increases their marital or their partnering conflict. They tell us it's really, really hard on their kids. And they tell us that serial caregiving one after another is exceedingly hard on family life. So that's where we need to dig in and provide a lot more su support up front to help caregivers during those. Next slide, please. Oops, no. there we go. So I think we went two slides. There we go. We also, thank you. We also know that the kind of, um, uh, that tells us about how we keep caregivers. Now what do we know about how do we make caregivers the most effective caregivers we need who are loving and provide lots of positive and reinforcement for kids and bring down children's behavioral problems. We know that coaching models can be very, very effective. Bringing social workers into the home, doing in vivo coaching, analyzing inter, um, uh, interactions between kids and caregivers and practicing new strategies together. So we do know that these coaching and consultation matters uh, programs matter a lot. And we also know that providing support for caregivers with others of caregivers also matters. Last slide. Um, if there's anything you take away from my slides today, take this one, copy it, put it on your wall. These are the top 10 strategies pain and support caregivers based upon the research evidence. Very briefly, we know that, that retention 
just starts from the very first interaction. When we move from contemplation to action and folks come into our caregiving system, they want to hear the mission of your agency. They want to hear how much you love kids. They want to hear how family focused you are. That's why they called you. They didn't call you because they wanted to fill out paperwork. They didn't call you because they wanted to talk about a smoke detector. They called you because they love kids and they want to share that with you. That experience of loving kids and feeling the mission of your organization needs to carry through over those next several months. They want support not only in daily life, but in emergencies. If there's an emergency, there should be a hotline call, there should be a mobile response team, there should be something so that somebody picks up the phone and helps them. They want to be part of a team and they want to be recognized for the heroic work they do. So affirmations that are much more than just an annual luncheon to tell our caregivers on a regular basis, you're doing great work, you're doing important work, you're making a difference. And that then takes the reason that they came into care and makes them stick with it for the long haul. All right, move on. <laughs> well, thank you, Jill. And you know, listening to you talk early on in, in what you were talking about, it just the like the dearth of evidence about what works in, in, in recruiting, right? And that we have to get better at that. I mean, there's no more important time really than now. Um, you know, there's a, the, I mentioned very briefly the Family First Act and that's coming online in a lot of states. Um, a big bunch of money just went out the door to states in, the, in, a, in kind of a transitional piece of legislation to help them comply with this new law. And a big part of it, especially in the short term, is going to be having a stable supply of quality caregivers, uh, whether they're relatives or or non-relatives or whatever. Um, and you know, now is the time to accelerate the, the learning and the knowledge base there. So now we're gonna go to Barrett, uh, Barrett Johnson over at Binti, who's gonna talk about a, a super important part of this conversation, which is how we can use technology to get at what Jill was just talking about. So you, you take it away, Barrett. All right, thank you, John. I couldn't agree more about the Families First Act. We're gonna need more homes than ever um, if we're really gonna um, step youth down um, into a family setting like we need to in, in Families First. And we learned that in California with uh, the Continuum of Care Reform, which is sort of a precursor. Absolutely. To that. Um, also, thank you to Jill. I always appreciate the academic rigor you bring to this and also the, uh, your focus on just the quality um, and the, the, the heart in the work. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the role of technology uh, in uh, building our knowledge base. Um, first of all, I'll just give you a really brief uh, a little bit of background on Binti. Uh, Binti is a technology company. Uh, we're based in the Bay Area. We build software specifically for child welfare. Um, I was actually Binti's first uh, customer back when I was uh, in a program director in San Francisco County. Um, in late 2016, I met our, the CEO and founder of Binti, uh, Felicia Kakuru, and uh, she worked with our team in, in San Francisco and built our first two products. Uh, placements module um, and uh, um, the approvals module. The approvals module is the um, sort of like TurboTax to become a foster parent, plus a system to track all your work and get all your work done online for the social workers. The placements module helps to find those families and match them, um, match them to the to the youth really effectively and manage manage that work. Um, and since then, we've grown around the country, so we're around uh, in. 14 states across the country serving about 17% of the um, welfare population. So um, we're in over 100 agencies. So um, I want to, um, when we talk about uh, building the evidence base and build and using technology to build the evidence base and research base for, uh, for caregivers, we're really talking about this cycle on the this, on this slide here. And technology can help us in a number of different ways on this cycle. And I'm, I'll just go through really briefly and give you some examples for each. So first, starting at 12 o'clock there, technology can help us collect data um, systematically. Um, it can help us uh, aggregate that data, which we need to be able to do in order to learn from it, right? It should help us to use that data every day in the work that we do. Right, that technology should really help play a role in, in doing that. And that can sometimes be a, a problem with the, with the data that we have as it doesn't get translated into our everyday work. Um, it, and then we should be able to use that data to do the stuff that Jill does, which is like build the evidence and build research um, once we've done that. Um, and, and once we do that, then um, we'll 
our other panelists are going to talk about converting that into really good policy. It helps us to change our practice. Um, and then we're sort of not done that then yet though, because we need to then collect data to see if we're really being effective in doing our policy, or if that policy is really working as we expected it to do. So it's sort of a cycle um, that, that we go through. So um, you can go to the next slide. So technology helps us to, oh, that's a couple of, couple, okay. Technology helps us um, in a number of ways um, to sort of, to collect data. And one thing we've learned in child welfare is you have to make it easy to collect data or people won't enter data um, and you won't have good data, right? So um, you need a user interface that facilitates that, that works really, re works really effectively and helps people do their work. We've spent a lot of time at Binti really researching that and working out our user interface to make sure that it helps people do that you need to have multiple groups of people to be able to enter data. So um, for example, we have a portal for foster parents that they can enter a prospect of foster parents that they can enter all the information that they do and that pulls right through. So you don't have to enter data more than one time and you're getting it from the actual source. So um, that, that's a really important factor. You need a modern mobile interface. Um, people are used to um, entering and accessing data on their phones and devices all over the place and you need to be able to do that. So um, I'll show you that and we've, we've, we've built that in at Binti. Um, and you need um, to have quality data. You need to really be careful that you're um, gathering the, the data systematically and you're, you're making sure that the critical data gets entered before you let people move on to the next step and, and stuff like that. So paying a lot of attention to the quality of the data getting entered and that, that the data does get entered, um, the most essential data does get entered. So a couple of examples of that, you can go to the next slide. I mean, I think we found out um, during uh, COVID, we're, our, our, we've certainly heard from a lot of folks um, that you really need a mobile interface. You really need to be mobile in order to keep doing your work, um, but it also in order to access data on an ongoing basis. So you can go to the next slide. And um, this is just an example of, a, of the interface that we did at Binti that helps, um, helps foster parents get all their work done. So it's like a TurboTax-like environment or something that people are used to so that they can move through it, enter all the data, and that can get pulled through so everyone has access, access to it. So you can move on to the next slide. So the, the, the next area is, of course, aggregating that data. Um, and I, you know, I say from the beginning, everybody needs to pay attention when you're aggregating data to um, following all your protocols and human subjects <laughs> reviews and making sure that you're um, you're aggregating data in the right way um, and in the ethical way. Um, so, but when you aggregate data, you can use de-identified data, anonymized data, and that's how you really learn from things from a bigger picture, right? Because if, if you don't aggregate data, if everyone is using their own spreadsheet, all you learn from is the people on that spread, people in that spreadsheet. And you can't, um, you can't rise up and, 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 and look at the bigger picture and, 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 and learn more and build the evidence like Jill like Jill and other folks like her like to do. Um, so to do that, you need um, clearly defined data fields. So everybody needs to be kind of collecting the same data um, across, different, across different platforms. Um, you also need modern tools to share data across different platforms. So we have something at Binti called an API that helps to, that shares data with other systems, again, following all the ethical and legal protocols that you do that. Um, but it allows it so that you, for example, don't have to re-enter and re-enter and re-enter data in order to learn from it. So that, you know, people don't like to do that and therefore they don't do that and then you don't learn from it. So um, those are the kind of the key factors in terms of um, aggregating data. And you can move on to the, the next slide. And I, this is just a screenshot. We were pleased that uh, Children's, Children's Bureau did us all a solid. Um, and issued some guidance on this, which, uh, which talked about the role of technology and the role of collecting quality data and define some of those data terms for us, for us all as a field. So that's really important. It helps us to be able to collect all the same data and learn from it. Um, we were super happy about that at, at Binti. We collect all the, almost all the data that they recommended that you collect in the format they, they, they recommend. So that was great for us, but it's also really just great for the field that, that um, they've stepped up um, and, and gotten us all on, on, on the level on that. So you can move to the next slide, please. So 
then um, the other, the other, of course, key thing that we um, that we talk about is using that data in everyday practice. Okay, and this is where technology can sometimes fall um, fall behind. Um, so you need to make data accessible to all users in real time. So if they're out in the field, they need to be able to access the data and, and prompt them and enter the data and prompt them. We talked a little bit about that. You also need to be able, technology can help you tell a story about data, right? So you can surface um, data and visualize data in a way that people can understand um, something new about it and learn something about it in their everyday work. Um, also, you need to create um, the flexibility to look at data. So um, the way we've done that at Binti, all of our dashboards and data sets you can download into an Excel file so that the agency can look at them and, and can configure that data how they want and learn from it how they, how they want. And of course, that all leads to what we really want here is this sort of culture in an agency and in our work where we're looking at the information that we have and the data that we have and then we're tweaking what we're doing to try to improve things. And then we're looking at the data and see if it, if it helped. Um, and then we're tweaking it again. So that's sort of that, that cycle of constantly improving things and doing better at what we, what we do is key here. So just a few quick examples on the next few slides um, of, of, of that. Um, this is a report, you know, when we talk about recruiting and knowing, using recruiting data and every day, this is a report we have in Binti. I help, we helped to create this when we were in San Francisco to use it where it, it looks at every month who, how many people you've recruited and you can drill down and see those actual folks and see what happened if they got approved, if they are still waiting to get approved. And, and then you can drill down and see, you know, why. Um, or if they, if, if you had a big proportion of them, maybe you had a huge recruitment, but they all dropped out. So maybe, maybe your recruitment efforts that month, you don't want to do those again. So that's, that's an example of a report that sort of visualizes and tells a story. Um, and you can go to the next slide. This one is a little, uh, you can't see it that well on the PowerPoint slide, but this one also allows you to see the, the time to approval. Um, you know, we know at Minty, we measure this really, really, really carefully. We, wanna, we want people to approve more homes and we want them to approve them faster, right? So we also want them to improve high quality homes. So we want to learn about all, you know, the, the, the quality of the um, caregivers that they're getting. Um, so, you know, we know that in the year that people, um, because we measure the data carefully, the year that people use Binti, they start using Binti, they get 60% more homes and they do it 20% faster. But we want them to be able to look every day and measure their progress. And they use a report like this to do that. So you can go to the next slide. Um, and the next slide, it has, uh, I think, a map. So maps also tell us a lot. Um, uh, we built in mapping here. Maps can tell us something, anything that has to do with space, but specifically they can tell us, like, do we have the homes in the right places where our youth are? Are they close? Um, or are we recruiting um, in wrong areas? Where do we need to up our game in recruiting? Also for a specific youth, you can search and see like, it, are, what are the options and are they close to their school? So we loaded all the schools in um, so you can look at that. So it's just a, um, maps are really a great way to um, build, the technology can build in, um, you know, build in a way to use, your, to use the technology, use data every day. And um, la last, just a few words here. I know we're having, we've had, we're in sort of a rough patch here as a, as a society, right? <laughs> but it is an exciting future that we have. I think we are, we are finally getting to the point where we're um, really able to answer some of these fun, we're going to be able to answer soon some of these fundamental questions, like, like on the slide, you know, what, what types of activities are most productive um, in recruiting? Um, high quality foster parents, what are the characteristics? Jill gave us a list and what are the characteristics um, and, and we can test that out. What are the characteristics of people that um, provide really high quality um, and permanent connections for, for youth? And um, how, we, how well matched are our families' preferences um, and, the, and the families that we have in terms of geography and their characteristics to the youth that we need to, we need to place for them? And we can, we can use technology to, to help us to answer some of those questions. So, um, the next, the next area is sort of policy. So I'm going to pass it on over to um, the, the folks at, uh, at QPI and the Quality Parenting Initiative and the Law Center for that. Thank, yeah, thanks, Barrett. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jen in a, in a second. I just want to say the mapping thing is just such a great thing to see. I mean, you know, the, the, uh, 
you know, as, back, as far back as 2008 in federal legislation, we were starting to, you know, push state child welfare agencies to require that kids were able to attend their school of origin if that's what they wanted. And that was determined to be the best interest. And there were loopholes they needed to kind of tie together child welfare and education with that. Um, you know, but for years now, we've had that mandate and it's, it's really hard to do if you aren't able to kind of pinpoint foster homes to where schools are at. It becomes increasingly difficult if you're transporting a kid, you know, or hours one way or the other. Uh, but so, okay, let me uh, stop yakking here and move to uh, Jen, who is going to, like Barrett said, going to talk about how we uh, translate all this stuff to policy. Go ahead, Jen. Sure. Thanks everyone for joining the webcast today and um, thank you to the panelists before for laying out the, the groundwork of both what we know and what's possible. Um, I wanna say, I think this topic around foster parents and, and kin as well, it's policy, it's practice, but it's most importantly culture. Um, and so I wanna talk about all three of those areas in terms of changing um, our approach. Can you go back to the slide before, John? Sorry. There we go. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I think that it's important to start with the question of, so why is our information about the people that are most important to child welfare so sparse? Why don't we know more? And I firmly believe it's because even though in terms of science, evidence, research, there's actually nothing we know more about than families as the most important intervention for children who are at risk. And I wanna say this is not just in child welfare, even though the number one, and for a long time, the only evidence-based intervention we had in child welfare was attachment biobehavioral catch-up, which focuses exclusively on the foster parent's relationship with the child. It's now still the number one intervention, but actually across, child serving systems, families have been acknowledged to really be the only thing that we have evidence that works to change the outcomes, the lives, um, the trajectory of children. But somehow our child welfare systems have not caught up to this and they still think of our families in terms of a bed or a placement versus being the teacher, the mental health intervention, um, the connector of family, the support for holding together biological families, for making sure that children have extracurricular activities, for making sure that children have dreams. So our science is way ahead of the field. Um, and I believe that if the child welfare system actually acknowledged our, the importance of our families as being the only and most effective intervention that we had in child welfare, we would have prioritized collecting all of the information. Um, I also think that when we launched QPI 12 years ago, we did it in partnership with Dr. Mary Dozier who developed attachment biobehavioral catch-up, the evidence-based intervention. And what she had found in this intervention is there are specific behaviors that are associated with excellent parenting that result in long-term better outcomes for children. And that was my next point is she's actually the only person across the country who has tracked the correlation between the type of parenting and relationship between the foster parent or relative and the child in foster care and what happens over the long term. And at this point, the young people that she's following, she started following them when they were infants. They are now actually almost teenagers. Um, and she's seen that those, the impact sticks over time, which is really important information for us, that high quality parenting not only is critical to making our child welfare system work, it's not only important in the moment, but even when children reunify or go to another source of permanency and the parenting that that resource parent provided was brief, it can have a lifelong impact, both on changing children's biology in terms of changing their long-term um, outcomes, but most systems have really not defined what's involved with excellent parenting. And if they haven't defined it, they can't make those expectations clear. If they haven't defined it, they can't train for it. They can't provide supports for it. They can't make sure that foster parents are providing that to kids. So that's really a problem. Um, and then last thing that I want to say about why we don't more, know more is that we don't ask. We don't ask the people who know the most and who really matter the most to the system, which is our resource families, our foster families, and the youth who live in their homes. 
So when you do ask those people, you find information that's very surprising. It is not about, it takes the conversation away from the topics that usually we're talking about around sort of how do you create a bigger, better recruitment campaign or how do you speed up the process? Um, what you actually start talking about is quality of care. And I saw a couple people mentioned exactly what the conversation changes to, which is how do you take better care of the families who are doing a great job in your system and really providing that high quality parenting? And when you take it better care of those families, not only are they more likely to stay, but they're going to share their love for the experience and how meaningful it is with their friends, with their family, their community, which is what all the research tells us is sort of the most effective um, draw for people coming in. Can you go to the next slide, please? So what happens when you do ask? Um, so we actually launched the Quality Parenting Initiative 12 years ago now in Florida and the Youth Law Center, we're a policy shop. And the reason we launched this initiative is because we were working across the country in several jurisdictions to move children out of group care and congregate care into family care. And what we realized was that systems really didn't know how to do that. They didn't know how to approach foster parent recruitment or the idea of working with families as key partners and the primary intervention in a systematic way. So we started in a couple of jurisdictions where we had either litigated or done policy work um, to compel the system to move away from group care and move towards families. Um, since that time, we have expanded our quality parenting initiative out to about 80 jurisdictions across 10 states. And our work in those jurisdictions is to work directly with child welfare agencies, with the courts, um, on an approach that prioritizes excellent parenting as the most important thing that the system can offer and make sure that the leaders in those systems and the decision makers are hearing directly from foster parents, from birth parents, from youth, from the line workers that are working every single day with foster parents about both what the challenges are around recruiting and retaining excellent parenting and most importantly, what the solutions are. You can go to the next slide. Back one slide. All right, keyboard's a little sticky. Uh, oh, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what have we learned um, when we, if you could just, there you go. So what have we learned when we have asked? So what we have learned is, as I mentioned, sure, it involves changes in recruitment and training and licensing and retention, but really when we ask foster parents and when we ask youth and support staff about what is most important, none of those things come to the top of the list. What they actually identify is that you need to remove other practices that interfere with excellent care, and you need to scale up those practices that actually support excellent care. Um, and I think this is ironic because when we started to ask foster parents 12 years ago, the things that they identified as barriers to them being able to provide excellent care or being willing to tell friends and community members to come in and also be foster parents with them were the same issues that are probably the most damaging to children and youth in the system around accepted practices in child welfare. Now, if we could go to the next slide. So here are some examples of things that families identified that in QPI systems have taken on trying to work to change. So including families in decision making. Um, this was one of the first areas that families identified, that if they are the primary intervention, if they are the person who is with the child 24-7, then they need to be at every team meeting, they need to be in court, they need to be not just part of the scheduling around visitation, but actually leading the visitation when a child is transitioning out of their home, whether that's to reunification or another form of permanency or another placement, they should be leading that transition. Um, so that's one, one example. Another example would be support for co-parenting. Um, this, and this is really interesting because this is an area where we did have some research in California about four years ago now. The UC uh, Davis Center for Poverty Research did a survey of all families in California and said, we're launching a, a movement here to move children out of group care and into families. We wanna hear, would you be open to fostering a child in your family? And if so, why? Why would you be open? What they found was the same as the Dave Thomas research that you saw before. Approximately a quarter of families said, yes, we would be interested. Their number one reason was for the opportunity to support biological families and to help a family heal. 
So you don't see that reflected though on our recruitment uh, messaging in many systems. We have not prioritized co-parenting or shared parenting. We're not providing the training and support. Certainly we've created policy and practice barriers to that. Um, so I could go on and on and on, but that gives you an idea of the kind of issues that families are identifying really get in the way of retention. Transitions is another issue. Um, just about every single system we've worked in around the country says the reason our best foster parents quit is because of the way we have taken them out of the, our, their home, even when the transition was a happy one. So the child might be going back to their biological family. They might be going to another permanency um, that, that is celebrating, but systems rudely enter foster parents' homes with hours of notice, tell them to pack up the belongings, never give the child a chance to say goodbye, disregard whether there was a birthday party that was happening that weekend. Um, so this is the kind of thing that is extremely traumatic for the child, extremely traumatic for the family and other children that are in those families' homes that we're not acknowledging and they are, it's getting in our way of being able to retain. So if we can go to the next slide here. So, oh, back one. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so what do we do to change the approach? So I mentioned the practice policy, but also culture. If you want to see examples from jurisdictions who are working on changing those three things, um, there is our QPI website where you can go and get lots of information. Um, it also really requires an internal within our system and a public understanding of what foster parents do. Um, and how they do it and how important that role is in the community in order to create will. Um, and that requires also participation in these discussions of those that are closest to those issues. You can go to the next slide. So as John mentioned earlier, I've been part of, um, I'm a co-chair of the National Champs Campaign, which is a coalition of national advocacy and uh, foster parent and um, uh, you name it, organizations across the country who are involved with trying to make child welfare better. And the goal is to sort of change public percep perception and launch a campaign um, to help people understand the importance of foster parenting and to align their practice and policy with that. This is an example from um, the Champ Story Bank. So this is a uh, what was asked in Chance is for folks to write in and share stories of the difference and impact that foster parents make. There are actually hundreds of them um, if you go into the Champ Story Bank. So this gives you an idea. This is not a story that we hear in the media. So this is foster parent taught me that reunification doesn't have to be the end of a relationship between you and the birth family. The real gift came when the child's family honored the bond that was formed with me and my family by allowing us to spend as much time with her as we like. Weekends, vacations, birthdays. Our families have done things together as well. This is a story of building families and communities that is not the narrative that people understand foster parents to be. And so it's really important and powerful. You can go to the next slide, John. Um, here are some additional resources for CHAMPS um, that might be helpful in your jurisdiction. There is a policy playbook that extracts a lot of those practices and the efforts across the country from QPI and lays them out in the policy playbook. There is supporting research on um, some of those really important topics. There are some videos, a social media toolkit, a chance for you to sign up and get involved and learn more, some policy discussion guides. Um, but sort of changing the discussion and the approach to be, again, thinking that foster parents are the most important thing that we have to offer to our to children if we remove them from their home, that they are not just a bed, that they are not just a placement, that they are actually, coronavirus has like made it clear to the entire system. They are your teacher, they are your mental health intervention, they are your child's first and foremost friend. Um, I think coronavirus has helped people to understand what was honestly happening every single day. We should have always gotten that our families were that important. They're the most important key to reunification for our families. Um, so this will all help you make the case, I hope. Thank you so much, Jen. And there are, um, obviously you can't get to it right now during the webinar, but there are hyperlinks on there. So when this comes out, you'll be able to access everything that Jen was talking about in terms of chance resources. 
Um, she also brought up the idea, I'm glad you, you, you kind of singled in on uh, co-parenting and shared parenting because um, Barrett shared a, uh, a policy memo that uh, the feds put out, the federal government, I have short too much, um, on uh, technology. They've also just recently put out something really, really stressing the importance and the prioritization of shared and co-parenting strategies. I think that they framed it in their memo around the idea of using foster care as a resource to parents and reframing the picture around that. Um, off the top of my head, I know North Carolina kind of embraces that as a training for all foster parents. And I think that that's where things are headed in a lot of other places. So um, I wanna move now to, to Marissa to give us that, that ground level state view on, on everything we've been talking about. Go ahead. Thanks, John. And thank you everyone for um having me and for all of the information that you have shared and just as jennifer said um we have i'm also a part of the west virginia foster adoptive and kinship parents network is a partner for champs and all of those resources that jennifer shared are so helpful and really being part of the champs network has been incredibly helpful for our work on both policy and culture as jennifer said was so important um so if you can go to the next slide um what is our network is um sort of an association of foster adoptive and kinship parents that was started in the fall of uh, 2018 really started as just a facebook group and since then has grown to over 800 members um, and prior to sort of setting this up caregivers really were not organized we had small little pockets of support groups but we weren't organized to really have a voice in the system or be part of seeing system change happen um, so as I started to, to develop this network and dig into the work, I came, I worked in disability rights for 20 years and I was used to really having a fair amount of data at my fingertips. And I quickly found that that data was not readily available when it came to caregivers or even children. I could get a fair amount of information about the kids, but when it came to finding information about caregivers, I just, I, I really struggled. We couldn't find information about retention rates, satisfaction of caregivers, how they were feeling about the system or their support needs. As a former foster and now adoptive parent, I knew anecdotally and I knew from chairing a support group and working with other parents what many of the needs were, but I didn't have any data to back that up. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, fairly early on in building the network, we, um, oh, next slide, are we stuck? <laughs> there we go, um, nope. Um, we partnered with our state child welfare agency, the Department of Health and Human Resources, and Marshall University to develop and conduct a survey of all foster adoptive and kinship parents statewide. Um, and we, ha we had over a thousand responses, we really, which to me reflected people's interest in having a voice and being heard and that they really hadn't been asked their opinion. As Jennifer said, we, we haven't done a great job of asking people. So, um, so a couple of the findings, one was 78% of people who had stopped fostering said that frustration with the system was one of the reasons they stopped. And that frustration was reflected in, in some earlier slides, but a lot of it was not feeling like they had a voice in the system, uh, not receiving support when children were removed from the home, whether that was planned or unplanned. Um, really a lack of consistent communication across different parts of the system. So whether that was, um, child protective services workers, aid, private agency workers, guardians ad litem, the information they were getting was not consistent. Um, also over 75% of people said that peer support was important to them, but only about a third of our respondents said that they had access to peer support. So that was, and that's something that we've seen just in the network is being able to act to talk to other people who are living this experience on a daily basis, as opposed to just people who are working in the field who sometimes are living it, but don't always have that same perspective of what it's like to have someone come into your home every two weeks or every month or to have a child removed or a child placed with you and how what that experience is like so really leaning on each other has been um, important and then um, the biggest needs that we heard were having a voice and really being treated with respect by the system um, the next slide So um, we shared the survey results with our legislature. Um, we shared with them before we did the survey and after. And the survey and some other factors also really resulted in sweeping foster care reform in our 2020 legislative session with five different bills that were um, passed during session that all impacted foster care or adoption. Uh, the biggest one was a, um, a bill that included foster, and, and foster parent and foster child's bills of rights. Uh, stronger oversight of guardians ad litem. One of the things we found from the survey was that 
our guardians ad litem really were, uh, many of them are wonderful. Some of them were really not checking in with families the way that we needed them to and really not interacting with the children. So um, we put some stronger oversight into that bill. Um, changes that ensure that caregivers are included in planning meetings, that's, that's also been a challenge where caregivers just haven't been invited to the table. Uh, so we're working to change that. And also clarifying due process and strengthening that. Um, also, in, because we couldn't do this via legislation because it's a different branch of government, the Supreme Court has established um, a new call line where people can call if they either have complaints or concerns about the guardian ad litem serving the children in their home. So we're hoping to get a, a better handle on that. And then um, caregivers, this was really the first time that we saw caregivers empowered to be involved in this process. Um, having them at the table, having them at the Capitol, sharing their stories with legislators. Um, and just to go back to my experience working in disability rights, when I see the, the structure and the support and the advocacy that's been done in that community, it's been because the people most impacted are empowered to be involved. So enabling our foster parents to be at the Capitol and have their, tell their stories and really be part of that process has both allowed lawmakers and policymakers to better understand the needs, but also allowed foster parents and kinship parents, and every time I say foster, I mean kinship as well, and also adoptive, to really feel like they're part of the process and they're valued and their, their needs are, are respected. So that was an important part of that. Um, there are, the policy change was great, but there are a lot of things still to come. Uh, it was really just a first step. And as Jennifer so perfectly explained, um, while we had policy change, we really need culture change in order to improve practice. They really have to go hand in hand. So um, working toward that and toward understanding, um, having a better understanding of the needs of our caregivers. Um, and then through COVID-19, we've also seen some, some real highlight of the needs of caregivers. Um, communication has been one of those biggest needs, um, especially as I look at in our system, we sort of have two different systems for kinship caregivers and for foster parents. And so we've seen different treatment between those two different levels of communication and support provided. Um, there is always a need for peer support and there has been almost more so during this, this emergency because people are at home all day with their children and, and needing to reach out more. Um, uh, support during and after reunification has kind of come to the forefront and then also post adoption support, um, which is a huge, need because just because you adopt doesn't mean that the trauma goes away or the needs of the child or the family disappear and so making sure that we're including adoptive families in this process as well. Um, also I want I don't have a slide on this but I wanted to mention um, someone asked I saw a question come over about teens and we did ask in a survey about what people would need to what resources they would need to foster teens and the biggest things that came up were training and support respite care and behavioral health. Um, and I also have a document that we developed through the network where I asked people what, you know, what resources would help you feel more comfortable fostering teens and I'm happy to share that. But the biggest lesson out of that was asking the people who are currently doing it, <laughs> what's working for you, asking people who are currently fostering but maybe not so open to fostering teens, what would you need and then how can we make sure that we're providing that. So getting back to that front line and I think I have one more slide. Or do I not? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, Thank you. So that's, a, that's actually a good transition, and I will let everybody else, uh, if they want to weigh in on teens, get to that in a minute. But Marissa, um, I kind of want to start with you in talking about coronavirus because you're actually like on the ground dealing with foster parents in real time as they're dealing with this. So tell us, I mean, just share with us sort of what their experience has been like. Um, I would throw just the one question at you and you share whatever you want, but I think now that we have the benefit of like two months of experience with this, if you could go back and say, okay, we should have done this for foster parents and, and, and families, like what it would have been, uh, but go ahead. Yeah, so the two biggest thing, the biggest thing that I wish we had in place for not just COVID, but a variety of other reasons is a rapid communication system that would easily email or text to every foster and kinship parent, every parent who has a child who's in the custody of the state would get the same information. Here's the protocol if, a if someone in your home gets sick. Here's what you do if a child you know, in foster care or kinship care gets sick, uh, you know, gets COVID. Um, some other information resources, but just to be able to rapidly get that out to everyone 
um, would have been really helpful, I think. Um, so that's one. And the other, the biggest need that I have seen come up is a need for additional technology. Um, lots of families struggling with only one or two tablets or one laptop and having to do, I mean, I had one family tell me they had a minimum of 13 hours of a week of required video calls. You know, and that was, that was just the required, not counting school. <laughs> That's social workers and therapists and birth families and everything else. So the need for extra technology and for, of course, broadband, because we have lots of parts of our state that are, are rural and don't have, have good internet access to begin with. But, um, and then I think behavioral health support when, when we're all home and routines have been disrupted and just the challenges that come with that. John, if I, if I could add on to what she's saying to, um, Initially, when we asked in our QPI sites, the families there, what did they need? The last point that Marissa made is they really needed expert help in navigating sort of the new issues and scenarios that they were placed with. So they needed to be hearing like screen time recommendations. We know we're not supposed to be letting young children be on screens, but now the whole world has changed and everything is on screens, including visitation, um, including you know, relationships with siblings, including school. So what do we do with that? We have been working to try to develop a relationship with the birth family, but how do you do, can babies form a relationship with a parent or maintain a relationship from behind the screen? Um, so what, what we did in QPI is immediately we launched a, a national training series that was targeted at foster parents and birth parents with bringing national child development and adolescent development experts directly to the families. And we initially thought it was a small thing, but at this point we've had over 6,000 families from across from 30 states across the country who have participated. And one of the things that they've said is, number one, this is the first time that they've been given access to sort of the expert developmental folks who are looking at them now as the expert, right? Like they are responsible for their, for whether the child does well educationally, for whether the visit goes well, like at this point. So now they're finally getting sort of the support and information that they've been needing all along. I think that's one thing. But then the second thing is that many of the families are saying the system is actually functioning better for them right now than it was previously because people are acknowledging that they are the primary role. They have to be involved with everything for the first time people are asking are you okay do you need anything do you need food delivery do you need diapers do you need technology in your home i mean so these are some of the things that i think we have to visitation has become in many cases easier for families because rather than sort of transporting and schlepping twice a week for a couple of awkward visits at the family visitation center now families have learned like from this webcast and other things techniques like let me put a rolling camera in the room while the child plays and they can have natural contact several times a day rather than limiting it down to twice a week and you can maintain a relationship that way. So these are things I actually would have never suspected on my own if I hadn't been hearing from families that there are actually things that are going better right now for in foster care than they were previously. So they're really important lessons to be learned, I think, from that. That's really great. That's really great to hear, I guess, in a weird way. Um, Barrett. Uh, I wanted to add on to that a little yeah, bit. I want, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, Marissa, you saying that um, uh, about communications, because we heard that loud and clear with folks. We had a way that people could communicate, um, but we built out a feature right away that allows people to communicate, um, do sort of instant commun communication blasts out to um, different groups of people really easily. So that was one of the first things that we heard from folks. Um, and, and just the, the role of um, technology. I mean, we're all getting tired of using technology, but when you, when you don't have it and you can't keep the work moving, um, you know, we really heard from our, from our folks that were using Vinti about that, that they, they were so appreciative that they were able to keep their, their, work, their work moving um, because they had a web-based platform to do, to do it. Right on. So Talia, if you want to jump to the next slide here, um, obviously it is, uh, it has been an hour. We, we kind of extended the room a little bit thinking that we might, uh, we might get tied up talking a little bit about coronavirus and, and get some questions during this, uh, 
during the webinar. But I do want to try and do a little rapid fire here and get some answers to some of these things. And, and thank you to the panelists have been really great about just re responding actually in real time as we're doing this. Um, for any questions we didn't get to or anything that pops in your head afterwards, um, all our contact information is right here for everybody that's been on the webinar. Um, real quick one to start with Marissa. Um, somebody asked if you're able to share the questions you included in the survey that you guys did. Um, yeah. Should I have people just maybe at email to ask you for that? If you're yeah, that's fine. I have to still put it in a format that I can share, but yes, I'm happy to share it. Okay. Um, so Marissa took on the, the, uh, the teen question that we got earlier, which was, we're trying to increase the number of families who will take teens. Are there any specific recommendations of what seems to work to attract foster families for teens? And I would add that and as we've done our Who Cares data collection, we have had states who reported, you know, an increase in the number of foster homes who have also said in the email quite candidly, like, you know, this number looks like it's going up, but we really struggle in this county or we really struggle, but a lot of them say, we really struggle to find foster homes that will take teens. So does anybody want to take that on? Any, any knowledge to, to impart here? Uh, I'm going to jump in and just say that we have to do a better job around family finding and engagement, for, particularly for the teenagers. If the longer a child has been on the earth, the more I do not buy that there are literally not more and more adults who have met that child over some time in their life who have no idea that they are in foster care and who would be willing to play a role. So this is former foster parents, teachers, former neighbors, the friends of, friends' parents. Um, so I think like that is our sort of number one best bet for recruiting for our teenagers is looking for those folks who there is already a relationship, even if it's a relationship that that youth has forgotten about years ago. And I won't go into that because there's tons of practice manuals around how to do that effectively, but we know how to do it basically. And if, if all of us can find like our first boyfriend from elementary school or junior high school, you can find those people. So that's one thing I wanna say. But the second thing is around the um, recruiting for teenagers is that really work with your foster parents and use your foster parents. And one of our QPI sites, um, Ventura County, they hired foster parents as peer parent educators and their entire job was to go and meet those youth who were in group care and at the shelter in Ventura County and then meet foster parents and then look for where there would be a match and talk about. So they go to the family and say, I want to tell you about Marissa who is looking for a family. These are the things Marissa loves to do. This is a little bit about why we think she'd be a great fit with your family. And they were able to drop down their population and group care by about half using this technique around their experience, foster parent and peer educators. They also use those same experienced foster parent and relatives to stabilize placement. So when foster parents would call and say, I'm at my wit's end, I'm ready to give notice. Um, in both Ventura and in San Diego County, they are deploying the, those peer educator, those experienced foster parents, and they've been able to stabilize somewhere between 75 to 90 percent of those placements just by having somebody who has walked in those shoes and who is sympathetic and who can really support and advocate for that family. So your foster parents in your system, they can do so much more than what any of us are actually imagining, giving them the opportunity to really play a role in both around recruitment and support. Um, here's a good one, Marissa. I know I, I think you'll definitely want to weigh in, but anybody here, here's, here's the, the comment question. We've struggled with peer support with our foster care providers. We try to initiate support groups and no one shows up. We also do a mentor list, but our providers don't engage. Are there any ideas on how to increase support for providers in this situation? So Marissa, you've built one. Uh, what, what advice do you, do you have? That. Um, a couple of things. One is making sure that it's really peer led. Uh, one of the things that we see and I see in my Facebook group and other platforms all the time is that people, people will share so much more with peers than they will with professionals who have the ability to ultimately remove kids from their home. Um, so making sure that it's really peer led and that, you know, peers are able to share freely with each other. Um, and then we use a variety of strategies. Um, in person can be challenging. We're actually kind of using um, Zoom right now as a way to build geographically specific 
support groups in hopes that when we're back to doing face-to-face -face things, we can people will already have some relationships. But I think we'll always have some that will be online, um, specifically around certain groups like teens or um, you know kids with higher needs, so that they can be more ge geographically diverse. Um, and then having uh, really helping people build the relationship, I think that's what really drives people when they feel like they can call somebody outside of the group. They feel like they can they're connecting with people and, and can really um, share information. But, and then for us, uh, we're asking, and it's all pretty new, but we're also asking groups to do an advocacy project of some sort, which helps to get, get families involved in something. So it's not just coming and talking about their problems or their experiences, but it's, it's how can we then find some solutions and help bring those solutions about? How can we have our voice heard more? How can we you know, be involved in that process? So I think that that has helped us kind of grow some of those too. Anybody else on that one? Got a couple more. Um, any tips for therapeutic placements, how to attract families who are up for the challenge of taking children with uh, acute behavioral or emotional needs? So I just wanna call attention to one of my favorite programs, um, which is the CHANCE program in South Florida. Um, with the Citrus CBC. And so they actually have a therapeutic foster parenting program for youth who have experienced commercial sexual exploitation. And there is an organization in San Francisco, California, Freedom Forward, who's in the process of replicating um, that same uh, foster care program. And their most important point was they recruited internally. So they recruited within sort of the pool of parents who was already doing a good job at taking care of teens um, and who had shown themselves to, to like teens, to have all the qualities that, um, that you heard about earlier in Jill's presentation. They were flexible, they had a good sense of humor, um, they were up for the challenge. And they gave those foster parents the specialized training and sort of started with a couple of them and then really put them in charge of recruiting other foster parents because people who are really good at this they know other people who will be good at it. And so, as all of you know, the narrative across the country is, you know, and the narrative has made it into our policy that this group of young people, young people who have been commercially sexually exploited, they are sort of the one carve out that systems have been, you know, uh, willing to say they're most, they're, they don't deserve to have a family. They can only be served in a congregate setting. However, their program is evaluated every single year. They have fantastic outcomes for those families. Um, so I think, again, going back to having the families and, and Mikey weighed in and reminded the youth as well, having the families and youth be part of recruiting and seeing whether folks are up for the challenge um, and then really providing a lot of assurance to them that they're going to be part of the team. Like they are not going to be in this on their own and we have to change that. That's a practice issue because it's not just about recruiting, it's about the reality of when those folks come in to care for children that have a lot of needs, are they really going to be fully supported by the system and have everyone wrapping around? If there's a licensing allegation, are people gonna have their backs and believe that they had the best intentions in the situation? Are they gonna have in-home mental health support? Are people gonna return their phone calls? Are they gonna to have to leave 10 messages before anybody gets back to them? You have to change those things. And then you have to have foster parents who say, this is great, I love being, this is so meaningful, I love being part of the team. And they'll spread the word and you'll be able to recruit more. Can I add something to that? Good. Sorry, I just wanted to say, not necessarily for, for kids who have been sexually exploited, but other kids with other types of high needs. One of the things I think I've, I've been saddened to see is that we don't do a great job of reaching out to the other systems. So the disability community has a tremendous amount of peer support and we know, and I know some people see this as a negative, I actually don't, but at least 75% of kids in foster care have some kind of disability under, like under the ADA definition, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And some people see that as a bad thing. In the disability community, we actually talk about how that's just a part of, of who I am. It's one of my strengths. It makes me who I am. And it gives me rights. Under, under certain federal laws, that gives me rights. Um, but we don't tap into the services and the support that's available in that system very well, usually. So that's one of the things that I'd like to see is, is 
to be able to connect families with the existing supports. There's lots and lots of parents out there raising kids with high, with high levels of need. And so the more that we can sort of normalize that experience and connect them with other families doing similar things, maybe they're outside of the child welfare system, so it's a little bit different, but they still understand and have really great techniques and, and you know, tips for how to manage those challenges. Thanks, Marissa. So we are really running up against the actual uh, end time of uh, the webinar here. So um, I will address one just very technical question. Uh, somebody asked what the web address for where the final webinar and PowerPoint will be posted. Um, that is actually a link that will be sent to you if you registered, uh, even if you didn't attend or if you've, you've had to jump off, we, you'll be getting an email that's got a link. So you have all this information, uh, you know, in, in recorded form as well. Um, and again, you know, on this, on the presentation, when you get it and on your screen right now, you've got all our contact information. You can reach out to any of us with, with questions. So with that, I want to thank Jill, Jennifer, Marissa, Barrett, uh, for joining here today. I think this was a great conversation and, uh, you know, one I think that we'll, uh, continue to, to have over time here. Uh, so thanks you guys, uh, for joining us. Um, and thanks to everybody who attended.